the, the, the phone conversation uh, with these folks. And uh, right after that, at the end of the conversation, they said they had a check for us. And it turns out it's going to be a slow release sort of check for about $500,000 for the Dark Sky Initiative. Yeah, so it's an incredible, thank you. And the work of Vicky Santiago, everybody just made this happen. And so we've got this incredible opportunity to help retrofit all the rest of our lights that we need. But a good spillover of that m money is going to go to education and outreach, possible exhibitry, displays. And so my sort of question to you is, you know, given Grand Canyon's platform as this huge just forum for six million people a year coming to, coming to visit this place, how can we most effectively use some of these funds to uh, propagate the Dark Sky initiative and, 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 and the mission of the IDA and all of us here in this room. So just an incredible opportunity. And so uh, we're going to go through this Grand Canyon story. Just a, the trajectory here is talk a little bit why Grand Canyon. Uh, then we'll move into Santiago's data management portion, uh, which is fascinating uh, how he crunches all the numbers there. Uh, the retrofit process will be led by Vicky. We'll uh, jump back into what we're kind of doing in interpretation and outreach so far. And then we'll conclude with hopefully looking up, looking forward in the future, hopefully get some good ideas, uh, questions, brainstorming sessions on, you know, how we can make this Grand Canyon just the, uh, one of the, the best platforms for uh, spreading that dark sky message. So. Uh, why Grand Canyon? Well, how many of you guys have actually been to Grand Canyon National Park? Very nice. <laughs> okay, excellent. So you guys all know what I'm, I'm talking about when we talk about why Grand Canyon. You go up to the rim of the Grand Canyon, and during the day, you're looking at a geologic library that shows more aggregate time of sort of Earth's history in one view than almost any other place on the planet. You know, it just conjures these feelings, emotions within us. It's and one of my favorite quotes about this place, John Muir famously said, here we see the proudest temples and palaces and stateliest attitudes, wearing their sheets of detritus as royal robes, shedding off showers of red and yellow stone like trees in autumn shedding their leaves, going to dust like beautiful days tonight, proclaiming as with the tongues of angels the natural beauty of death. And this is what we get to sort of feel and experience during the day at Grand Canyon. And we preserve over 11,000 years of human history from Paleo-Indians during the, the end of the last glacial maximum of, the, of this ice age down to the Puebloan peoples who still thrive and live in Grand Canyon and around Grand Canyon today. There are 11 tribes intimately connected with Grand Canyon. We celebrate their cultures on a weekly basis out at places like the Desert View Watchtower. This is a uh, place that is a witness to immense cultural history. I mean, this is Teddy Roosevelt's stomping grounds. And uh, not a lot of people know this, but he actually designated Grand Canyon as a national monument in 1908 against the wishes of all the prospectors and miners and entrepreneurs who were living there at the time. But he had a bold vision. And I think this kind of applies even to what we're all trying to conserve and protect here today. It's a radical statement even today. He says, there is nothing in the end more practical than the preservation of beauty and the preservation of anything that appeals to the higher emotions in mankind. And that's a really bold thing to say to a bunch of creepy miners looking at you, stroking their beards like this. You kidding me, man? Protect this place because it's pretty? But he had a, a vision that in 100 years from when he said that, people would be able to come and see an ancient relic of the Ice Age flying over their heads. Like with the California condor, we protect some of the most endangered species on the planet, largest land bird in North America. We protect an incredible ecosystem from the mixed conifer forest on the north rim, over 8,000 feet, all the way down to the upper Sonoran, down by the river. So this is the equivalent of latitudinally going from Mexico to Canada, where it's about 20 degrees warmer on average at the bottom of the canyon than it is at the top. And so we've got just all these immense things that we're protecting and preserving. But as we all know now, you know, with Tyler Norgren's uh, great quote that he's given us to the park service, half the park uh, is after dark. And in fact, when you stand on the rim on the canyon at night, I don't think there's anywhere else on nocturnal earth that you can stand between so much revealed deep time beneath you and revealed deep time above you. And to be standing in between that gives people this... Uh, immense joy and transformative experience, which I think is worth protecting. So I don't have to go into this so much. We all know why Grand Canyon is geographically an, uh, an incredible place to preserve the night skies. It's already got some of the darkest skies in the country being high on the Colorado Plateau uh, in, in uh, the, the high desert, dry southwest. 
we've also got an immense uh, history of astronomy that we're trying to preserve here. And these are kind of the themes I want to plant in your brains or when we're talking about what type of exhibitry, what type of installations, things we can use to further the dark sky initiative. These are kind of some of the themes we can work with, which not a lot of people know about. And we're not talking about nearly enough at Grand Canyon these days. Anybody know who this is? This is March 1964. This is Neil Armstrong a mere five years before he was going to be the first man to step foot on another world. Looking out of Grand Canyon, there's an immense uh, uh, amount of training that went into uh, 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 the Apollo program here at Grand Canyon. 18 astronauts in 1964 came to Grand Canyon. They hiked down the South Kaibab Trail. They stayed at Phantom Ranch. They hiked back up Bright Angel Trail. Well, they hiked halfway back up Bright Angel Trail. Then they got on mules and took them all out. Everybody except Al Shepard. He hiked all the way out. Famously competitive astronaut. And uh, so we have uh, Neil Armstrong. Just imagine what this guy's thinking right now. I mean, he's being in, he's, he was deliberately sent here to become inspired by geology, to learn about field geology. And uh, so he could take those applications and, and apply them to the moon. So I like to think, you know, he's thinking of certain other John Muir quotes that I like, I love thinking about. Like uh, one is what she says, we look down the gulf of color over the immense rim and in no more than any other view I know makes us uh, think of Earth as a star with stars swimming in light, every radiant spire pointing toward the heavens. Here they are chipping away at the rocks, learning field geology. That there is Jim Lovell, Pete Conrad right there, John Young, Tom Stafford. Come. So this immense history. Another really interesting facet that we don't talk nearly enough about, but it's really neat. Uh, Back in the 1920s, there was almost the largest observatory uh, in the world built on the edge of the Grand Canyon. And this was spearheaded first by George Hale in the uh, late 1890s. And uh, after George Hale, famous you know, observatory constructor, kind of fell out with his partner, George Ritchie, famous uh, telescope maker, George Ritchie then became obsessed with the Grand Canyon and wanted to build this observatory on the Grand Canyon, uh, Grand Canyon Rim. He, he, he must have known that it wasn't the most effective place to, to have a, you know, a, a observatory right on the rim of the canyon. I mean, there's some problems with the astronomical seeing right on the rim of the canyon with turbulence and whatnot. He would have been best just going a couple thousand feet back. But historians think he was just swept up by the romanticism, the idea of having an observatory right on the rim of the canyon. So much so that he actually published in a, a Paris newspaper uh, his plans to put uh, an observatory on the rim of the canyon. And this is actually a photo taken by George Ritchie uh, and a drawing that he made that he superimposed on this, uh, on this uh, picture. And this was so getting so much buzz that actually George Hale, who's kind of being alienated a little bit by George Ritchie, sent a young pupil of his out to go check this astronomical seeing of Grand Canyon South Rim, one Edwin Hubble. And Edwin Hubble came a mere few weeks, three weeks or so, before he made one of the greatest discoveries in astronomy and, you know, sealed his fate as one of the most famous astronomers in history. Uh, and he came and he tested the astronomical scene. Well, this, this was never built, but it's, it's a fascinating uh, history. And in fact, what was built in place of it in the 1930s? The Desert View Watchtower, and a lot of historians actually think that Mary Coulter, who constructed the Desert View Watchtower in the 1930s, got the name Desert View Watchtower from a newspaper clipping talking about that early um, observatory that they were calling the Desert Watchtower. So pretty cool. And inside the Desert View Watchtower, we're still preserving incredible cultural astronomy from the 11 tribes that are connected to this region today. So if you go in, I challenge you to find some of the uh, astronomical lore in there from the Hopi what we would call the Big Dipper, the Corona Borealis, the Pleiades. We've got the Path of the Sun from the two Kivas. We've got the Path of the Milky Way, comets, meteors, morning star, sun, moon. Uh, another uh, sort of warrior star depiction of Venus that possibly migrated up from Central America, which is pretty interesting. And, and so uh, the, the, the entire region here, culturally, cultural astronomically, ethno-astronomically, archaeoastronomically, is one of the richer places in, in the world. We have an incredible ethnographic record of uh, some of the Puebloan tribes, like the Hopi, the Zuni, how they would track the sun over a course of the year. Uh, we've, we've got detailed records of that, which is uh, incredible and not, not all that common. 
The Kaibab Band of Paiutes, as some of us might know, is the first international dark sky nation in the world, right there on the North Rim. Uh, the Navajo have a constellation canon that rivals the Greek constellation tradition in its richness. And as a semi-nomadic tribe, has a recent history of nomadicism. The, the heliacal rising of stars would have been more of interest to them than perhaps the rising of the sun and the moon over a fixed horizon. And so their, their development of a constellation canon uh, was more appropriate than, say, folks like the Hopi or the Zuni. But we've got this incredible constellation canon that we can celebrate here at Grand Canyon. And then the greater southwest, of course, just with its archaeoastro... Uh, uh, archaeoastronomy is is incredibly rich and so these are some of the themes that we just kind of want to plant right in the beginning in, in, in your uh, in your heads to start thinking about um, some things that we might be able to do with this incredible funding opportunity that we got to expand the dark sky initiative around the world but before we get into that uh, and and uh, sort of uh, come back to that at the end of the talk. Uh, we want to just get into the nuts and bolts here about how Grand Canyon really became an international dark sky park. It's fascinating, it's complex, uh, and these two folks over here are kind of the two who really made this happen. I mean, I'm just really the, the lipstick on the pig. So uh, these, these are the ones who are make, doing the nuts and bolts stuff, and so it's my privilege to introduce Santiago Garcia to start talking about how we uh, initially got this uh, data management off the ground. And I'm going to use this microphone. I'm not as dynamic and, you know, an enter person. Give it a clicker. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Do you need the clicker? Thank you. Here's a laser pointer. Yes. Right above the earth. Great. Thank you. So I'm Santiago Garcia, and I'm the data manager for Grand Canyon National Park. And Raider was, you know, super um, kind and said, my part of the presentation is fascinating, and that's, you know, Quite a compliment. I don't usually think of data management as fascinating, but I'll try to just kind of in a broad sense give you um, a, a perspective on why this part is important in terms of um, our story. Um, so, so I have the opportunity to work with all sorts of data. I'm housed out of Science and Resource Management Division at Grand Canyon. So I deal with wildlife data, vegetation, physical sciences data, all sorts of data. And this project is the one that's really touched me the most. It's, it's produced some really tangible results that, you know, I can go on a walk in the, in the evening and actually see some of the results of, of this work. And, and so it's really, um, heartwarming and, and I think super special. So, yeah, it's a special project for me also. So a little bit of the background in, in terms of um, specifically the, the lighting inventory portion of this, of this story. So one of, one of the big contributors to kind of the initial um, uh, part of this project is the Grand Canyon Conservancy, formerly known as Grand Canyon Association. So they provided quite a bit of the funding for this project. And I also want to mention, whoops, wrong button. I'll get the hang of this. Let's see. There it is. Nope. Okay. So Joe Orr and the Orr Family Foundation, they were a huge contributor to um, the initial uh, part of this project, so it's really important to to make note of that. Um, okay, and so because of, of this initial funding, um, we were able to hire a Night Skies inventory coordinator. So the purpose of that position was to conduct this initial uh, lighting inventory. Um, and so through that position, um, she developed Laura Williams. You may have heard of her through interactions with her. She developed um, our initial inventory methods. And so those were field methods in terms of what data we're going to collect down the field, what, um, what, what that's going to look like, the actual procedures that data collectors are going to follow. So that, that's a big important piece. And, and she took the extra step and the extra time to work closely with myself and our GIS coordinator, 
Mark Nabel. Um, and that's actually kind of a, a big piece of uh, this part of the project because because of that close coordination and integration, we're, we're able to do um, some things pretty seamlessly and pretty easily. And Vicky will kind of talk about some of the details of that. But the important point is kind of this groundwork set the stage for being able to do that. So just to give you a perspective in terms of that initial effort, the inventory took over a year to complete, right? And that's not to say, you know, it's 40 hours a week going out there constantly inventorying, but just quite a bit of effort and quite a bit of time dedicated to that. And, and a lot of volunteers helped in that process. So this, you're probably like, what the heck is this? So <laughs> this, this, pro, this uh, document here is actually pretty important. So it's a standard operating procedure for conducting a lighting inventory. So we spell out the field procedures, what data is going to be collected, how it's going to be collected. So it's, so it's all documented. Um, for repeatability and, and so that we have some sort of record in, in terms of what we accomplished. So that, that was a big effort. Um, the other diagram is because I am a geeky, you know, type, in a, in a geeky type position, I had to put this up there and this is a database diagram. <laughs> and so it's showing you the different tables that make up our database and the relationships um, among, among those tables, right? So, so it's not a, a simple spreadsheet, for example. We needed something much more robust that would capture the fields that we needed, the data that we needed. Um, and so the part that you don't see here is the integration with the spatial data, which is huge, right? That's very, very important. So that, that was accomplished through the, uh, using a unique identifier. So the tabular database this graphic represents is tied to the spatial data set using that unique identifier. And so the beauty of that is that I can go into the tabular database, select records, and that gets reflected in the GIS and vice versa. So if, if I want to select records spatially, I can do so and it's reflected in the tabular database. So it's kind of this seamless integration that, that's key for us in our, in our, in our workflow. Um, just a little more about the actual data collection. We, we used uh, a tablet, a digital device on the field to collect the data. And, and so this is the, the actual interface that was used to collect that data. And it's, so it's a fairly complex, um, you know, set of fields that are being collected. And so the point of this is, you know, it's not a straightforward, just one or two buttons per fixture. We're trying to collect quite a bit of information. Um, so we trained up the volunteers um, and they were able to use this interface to actually conduct the, the inventory. And just for those of you that are interested, this is an Access front end. So it's built on top of Microsoft Access, right? It's just a series of forms. Okay, finally, right, we're getting to the actual results of the inventory. So as Rader mentioned, a little over 5,000 fixtures park-wide. Um, and so our initial assessment was that about 34% of those fixtures are compliant, right? And, and that's at the time of the initial inventory. That, that number's gone up and Vicki will probably touch on that. Um, so to me, the more interesting part of this is actually the geographic distribution of those fixtures. So, you know, it's super clear that 
the great majority of the fixtures are actually in the South Rim Village, which makes sense. That's where most of the employees live, most of the visitors go to. So, so it's super skewed for that. So we have our little city there in the park. Um, the equivalent on a much smaller scale is the North Rim developed area. So a little over 700 fixtures there. Next is uh, Desert View, which is kind of the east entrance to the park. So a little more lights than, than some of the more kind of um, remote parts of the park. And finally, Phantom Ranch is next in line. So I, what I'm, I'm trying to give you a concept of the areas that have the greatest number of fixtures. So, and then everything else is just 76 fixtures, which is like, wow, that's it. Um, so I, I think it's, it's pretty informative. And so to kind of build on, on that is actually kind of this, this map that shows that distribution geographically. And so let me start off here. This is the South Rim Village, that black mass. Those are all the fixtures there. This is the actual entrance, the, the main entrance to the park. Um, here's Phantom Ranch. You know, here's the Colorado River. Um, over here is Desert View, so the east entrance to the park. Um, up here is the North Rim developed area and North Rim entrance. And then way over here on the west side of the park is a, pl is a lonely sta uh, ranger station called Two Weep, right? And I got to go out there and, and complete the inventory for that, for that spot, and it was total of two fixtures. But it, it, was a great, it was a great trip. I got to take an airplane over the canyon and spend some time out there and do the lighting inventory, so it was pretty cool. <laughs> so that, that gives you a sense of the geographic distribution of, of the lights. Here's a close-up of the South Rim Village itself. So really the intent, well, it doesn't look particular, particularly well, but so what I'm trying to get across here is kind of the, really the density of, of lights and in the village. There's residential areas here. Um, just to give you a um, little bit of perspective, here's um, Bright Angel Lodge, El Tavar area, um, the visitor center, the new visitor center. Vicky, it, I believe, is there? Is that that no, look? Right? Up in the upper right. Further up here. Okay, that's the visitor center. Um, so you can see there's areas that are quite dense in terms of of fixtures. Um, and and I should point out, green are compliant fixtures. Red non-compliant fixtures, and and so this is actually an updated uh, status. One more map, and so this is zooming in a little more, so you can get a sense of what the spatial data look like. Uh, this is Bright Angel Lodge. Um, so I don't think you can see the actual Bright Angel Trail, unfortunately. Um, but yeah, so you can see, you know, spatially we, we have the fixtures pretty well located. And so this is what the data looked like park-wide. So, um, I mean, it, it, was, it was a huge effort for um, the geography and just the number of fixtures. So um, yeah, just wanna rec recognize that, that huge initial effort. Okay, so, because we, we had kind of this um, initial work in terms of making sure that the tabular data and the spatial data were tightly integrated, it's allowed us to um, manage the retrofitting in a pretty, pretty efficient way. And so what happens is Vicky will um, identify a phase so we'll designate that spatially. And so in the GIS, what I can do is select all the fixtures and quickly output a spreadsheet that shows the unique identifier for each fixture 
its address, its status. Um, and so this is a, something that can be taken out in the field um, and updated. So we can make some pretty specific notes in terms of, okay, this fixture was actually incorrectly identified in the initial inventory. So we can do that. We can also then create a prescription for the retrofitting of that specific fixture. And so the spreadsheet gets updated and it can come back full circle and update our spatial uh, layer. So it's, it's a very efficient process and it, and it was um, a result of that initial groundwork that, that we completed. And so, you know, I kind of need to tout data management and its importance and so that's why I'm kind of stressing that. So the final kind of data management piece that, I, that I'd like to talk about is this online um, interface. So it's an interface built upon the ArcGIS Online platform, which is an ESRI product. Um, and, and so the goal of this product is really an online status tracker. So as we do retrofits, we can view it spatially, and I probably should have had a couple screenshots, so I kind of zoomed in here, but um, yeah, when you initially get on this interface, you can see the South Rim Village and you know quickly see areas that have been retrofitted, areas that need to be retrofitted. And, and so the first thing that comes up for us is this pie chart, and it'll be updated as we retrofit fixtures, this will be continually updated. So it's a you know, very simple way for non-technical folks to um, get a sense of, of what's going on spatially and with, with numbers also. Um, uh, the final thing I'll point out is you can click on an actual fixture and this little pop-up comes up and you can view um, the, the results of the retrofit in terms of, you know, what fixture was actually installed, what bulb was installed, so, so we can, you know, just get some details like that. So it's a pretty, um, just kind of regular type interface that you experience with Google Maps. You can pan around, zoom in, zoom out. Um, so I, I think something like this, in, especially in a, in a bigger, bigger effort, um, is a really good way to, to spatially um, show what's going on in, in terms of the project. And, and really, the, at least um, for us, it, it, a lot of it is um, spatial, spatially um, important. So, so we can view, view phases that we still need to complete. And um, so yeah, I think, this kind of final piece is an important part of the puzzle. So um, that's my part of the presentation. I'll turn it over to Vicki. So again, my name is Vicki Stinson and I'm a project manager for Grand Canyon National Park. And um, this is certainly my current favorite project at the park is to be working on the retrofits. Um, before I actually get into the details of the retrofit project or process, I thought it would be really helpful to go over some of the goals. <clears throat> The overarching and most critical is obtaining full status as an international dark sky park by 2019. Um, so Grand Canyon applied for and received provisional status as an international dark sky park in July 2016. And one of the primary requirements of obtaining that full status is to have 67% or two thirds of all of our exterior fixtures dark sky compliant within three years of that designation. And um, so when we received the provisional status, only 34% of the over 5,000 fixtures were considered compliant. And what that means is that 
within that three years, we have to run 100 fixed years by next spring. So while the full designation is the impetus, we also want to make sure that we utilize a holistic approach for selection of our fixed years and lamps. And um, first of all, any retrofit should be appropriate and in keeping with the historic facilities um, and shouldn't adversely impact wildlife. We also want to make sure that the fixtures and lamps are easy to maintain, are energy efficient, and that the retrofit stays compliant. So um, the best way to do that is to utilize fully shielded fixtures um, where possible so that in the event that somebody puts in a very bright blue um, lamp, uh, gets installed in, into one of those fully shielded fixtures, at least it'll be somewhat mitigated. Um, so a third critical goal, and you guys have heard um, Santiago and Raider talk about this, is to be accountable to our partners, Grand Canyon Conservancy, who is raising nearly all of the funds needed to do this International Dark Sky Park. And then lastly, we want to make sure that we're really flexible and open to modifying our approach. Um, and I can say for certain during the last couple of days, I've learned a whole lot and um, that's even more critical that we remain flexible as we move forward. So um, it sounds like a lot of you have been um, to the Grand Canyon. And for those of you who have been to the South Rim, we took on a large and somewhat prominent area for our prototype project or phase one. And um, this is, oops, this is the uh, rim lodge area in here outlined in red. This is the rim of the canyon. And this is about a half mile um, section with Verkamp's visitor center on the right and the Bright Angel Trailhead on the left. Um, it is part of a National Historic Landmark District. Um, it includes the El Tovar Hotel, which is about 100 years old, the Conchita and Thunderbird Lodges, which were built in the 1960s and 70s, and then the 1930s Bright Angel Lodge in this area. It consists of about 300 fixtures. Um, and 30 very different buildings. Um, so, and it also includes the only lighted portion of the rim trail, which goes in this area. Uh, most of the facilities are included in the concession uh, land assignment, and so that means that we need to be um, cooperating and working very closely with our concessioner, which is Zantera. So the first, the first part of the phase one was to test drive some candidate fixtures. So using the park outdoor lighting guidelines as well as recommendations from a study that Jim Benya and Chris Monrad did for us, we identified and ordered about a dozen fixtures to test drive. So some of the criteria that we used included choosing fixtures that were architecturally appropriate to the buildings and the landscape, especially within the historic landmark district. All fixtures were fully shielded. We had a variety of styles, colors, and finishes. Um, fixture types for the historic areas included kind of a barn light style shade, uh, which we've seen evident in some of our historic photos. And we also looked at powder coat as well as porcelain enamel finishes, um, primarily in dark bronze and black. And then we also considered colors other than white for the interior of the shade. Um, and so on the right are some examples of the porcelain coated barn light style in black. And you can see up on the pole light that we used a, a gray for the interior of the shade. Um, this carriage style fixture is what was replaced on the pole light here. 
We had about 12 fixtures installed in our initial test, and we had the opportunity to review those both in the day and at night. Uh, we also had a variety of stakeholders give us opinions and, and review these fixtures. We also tested a, a lot of different lamps, not only in the um, test fixtures, but also in existing historic fixtures to remain. So the testing not only helped us to decide on those that would work best for the park, particularly in phase one, but it also helped to provide some visuals for our NEPA compliance, which is required for every project. So the bottom left photo is of the El Tovar Lodge, and one of the test fixtures that we tried was this double mounted um, barn light fixture on one of the existing poles. Um, this was a seven foot pole, and we have about 20 pole mounted lights along the rim trail. This spaceship like fixture is what we were looking to replace. Um, <laughs> We also wanted to um, try a variety of gooseneck uh, styles and fixtures. This is a porcelain enamel coated bronze fixture and you can see there's a lot of utilities and piping in here that we had to work around. Um, but in some locations we could actually, um, we didn't really have a lot that impeded that. And this would be a powder coated fixture um, with a gray interior. Ultimately, we ended up utilizing just a single mounted. Um, we raised it up a little bit higher, put in new poles, um, and what that does is it points the light directly onto the trail. So um, once our tests and the NEPA compliance were complete, we did detailed prescriptions for each retrofit. We selected a suite of fixture types and finishes, including two styles of barn light shades, and we utilized barn light electric for that. They're out of Florida. We did ultimately decide on the porcelain finish, primarily because it's in keeping with some of the historic fixtures, but also because the color won't fade over time, um, like powder coating will, especially in that Arizona sun. We're using dark bronze for our buildings and black for the landscape fixtures, um, primarily because a lot of our poles are black. And then we selected a custom gray for the interior of the barn light fixtures um, because during the day it doesn't really stand out like the typical white would. Um, and it blends somewhat with the sky. And then at night, it's a little bit less reflective, uh, which has a really nice quality on the light. Um, and then we selected a Kitchler cylinder, cylinder fixture for some of the more contemporary structures, such as the Kachina and Thunderbird Lodges. For each fixture, we had to measure and make recommendations for gooseneck styles, if applicable, and or make recommendations for relamping. All of that was entered into the database um, to provide direction to our installers. Um, and also ultimately to update the inventory as, in, as Santiago was showing. It also serves as a record for those who maintain the fixtures because we put the lamp type in there as well. So for phase one, 91 fixtures were replaced, 113 were relamped, and 27 were permanently re removed. And um, for us, as we're doing this inventory, if we remove a non-compliant light, that makes it compliant. So that's a good thing. <laughs> so all of the new fixtures received new lamps. And for ease of maintenance, we're trying to keep the number of possible lamps down to under 10 types. Some of the criteria that we're using is that they should all be outdoor rated, LED, and medium base. Um, however, some of the pole light retrofits will likely use uh, integral LED drivers. They should be 2700K or less, um, but we are currently looking at some amber options. Generally, they should be 500 lumens or less, but again, there are some exceptions, particularly for task lighting, um, pole lights, 
and in parking lots. Um, the criteria being that if it is above 500 lumen, we want to make sure that those are fully shielded fixtures. Um, and these are the five lamps that we used in phase one. Um, I do want to point out that the, the one that's on the far left, um, this is one that we tested in clear and we found that even though it's only a 100 lumen one lot LED at 2400K, it was still just a little bit too glary. And the intent for this lamp is to use this in some of the existing historic um, fixtures that have, you know, like glass lanterns or something. Um, and I do also want to say that that fourth goal on my first slide was to remain flexible. And again, I have been learning a lot um, during the last couple of days, and I'm also a little bit confused about where to head in the future. But I think um, the fact that we are using medium-based lamps, um, presently these are about 10 bucks a piece. Um, I think that we have a lot of room and flexibility to make changes as technology advances. So I wanted to give you a couple of um, examples of uh, before and after shots. This is the Arizona room at the Bright Angel Lodge. You can see on the left, um, these carriage style lanterns uh, were the existing fixtures. We felt that they were a little bit low so we wanted to raise them up, but we also wanted to use the same electrical box. Um, so we used a kind of modified gooseneck fixture in order to meet both of those needs. And then as we were doing the retro retrofits, uh, we did find that there were other things that we had to do in some cases. So like in this case, we had to relocate the fire alarm. And then we went from a spotlight on the sign to this, um, barn light fixture. And this is a before and after um, nighttime view. It could just be that this is a really terrible photograph, um, but I do think that you can see just how glary that was. Um, and you can actually read the sign um, in the after shot here. So we're pretty pleased with the result. So phase one, we also had the opportunity to do some restoration work at the El Tavar. And I should mention that Craig Chenver is our historical architect at the park. He's been my sounding board definitely for um, both lamp and fixture choices, but he was heavily involved in getting these fixtures fabricated. So in the upper left, you can see these peeled um, poles with glass lamps. Um, this is probably circa 1920 at the El Tovar. Um, and then in the center photo, you can see that at some point in time, we made this switch to these carriage style lamps. And this is kind of a, a detail of that. So the bottom right shows a re uh, fabrication of the peeled pole fixtures. Um, these were painstakingly crafted by a man named John Ruggles in Flagstaff. Um, and I don't have a nighttime shot, but I can tell you that the 2000K 350 lumen lamps give really a lovely warm glow in this area. Not a glare, a glow. I do have a, a nighttime shot of the north porch at El Tovar, um, and we didn't do the, the custom log lamps in this area. I don't think they existed historically, um, but you can see in the before shot that we did have um, some of these, again, kind of carriage style lanterns on the posts. Um, and again, it's very glary. This is the after shot we used. Uh, ceiling mounted barn lights in this area. And then Zantera's preservation maintenance crew actually removed these fixtures from the poles and restored them. And they did such a great job that you can't really even tell that there was ever a fixture there. 
Phase two was another prototype project that we did, and this one was in one of the residential neighborhoods. We undertook an entire street, half a supai street, and the houses along this street were constructed in the 1960s, 70s, and 80s. Um, generally speaking, they're all one-story buildings with siding. Um, they each had at least one front and one back porch light, but others had as many as eight fixtures. Um, all in all, approximately 150 fixtures were retrofitted. And although there is some similarity between the houses, there are a variety of styles, um, colors, and residences have taken it upon themselves to decorate. Uh, so one really nice benefit was that the addition of a small but unifying and understated light fixture at every porch, and what we used was the Kitchler 9234, um, that provides a little bit of architectural unity throughout. Some of the residences also had motion controlled, uh, motion sensor controlled spotlights near their garages or work areas, and those were replaced by a shielded cast aluminum fixture by Orbit. And for both of these, we're utilizing um, a PAR-20 LED, which is 500 lumens and 2700K. And um, again, that lamp is recessed um, at least two or three inches in both of those fixtures. So having phase one and two completed, uh, it seemed to take a really long time. Um, in my mind, but what it did do for us is establish direction, method, and essentially kind of a kit of parts to move forward. So phase three um, is going to be a really big push. It will require over 1,200 retrofits by spring, um, and in order to and that's required in order to get our 67% dark sky compliant fixtures. So for this effort, we're focusing on the south rim where we have the greatest number of, of non-compliant fixtures. Um, and they're also relatively easy to do the retrofit. So we're looking at seven areas, including the Maswick Lodge, four residential areas, and the completion of the historic village area as indicated by number two. So as I said earlier, the National Environmental Policy Act, or NEPA, requires that we analyze and minimize to the extent possible any impacts to the natural and cultural resources for any undertakings that we do, even changing out light fixtures. So to streamline the approach and also provide some flexibility for some unknowns, we utilized a process of setting guidelines by area of development. So all of the South Rim buildings and landscapes were grouped into three categories by the era that they were constructed. Pre-Mission 66 is 1955 and earlier. Mission 66 is 1956 through 1972. And then post-Mission 66, 1973 to present day. How many of you are familiar with what Mission 66 is? Okay, we have a few. Um, so for those of you who are not familiar, Mission 66 was a, um, essentially a 10 plus year program that was intended to dramatically expand the National Park Service visitor services post World War II. And it was to coincide with the 50 year anniversary of the National Park Service, which happened in 1966, hence the name. It's somewhat controversial in that the modernism style of, of, of architecture utilized for the majority of that development uh, is really a stark contrast to the more historic architectural tile, styles or architecture. Um, so Santiago mapped all of the structures by era and provided a spreadsheet of each building number and address. We then provided um, photo set examples of typical buildings and landscapes for each era. 
and then developed a suite of typical fixture types and prescriptions for each area in a variety of conditions. So ceiling mounted, wall mounted, pole mounted. We completed the compliance with a finding of no adverse effect. And the State Historical Preservation Office Officer, or SHPO, who we also consult with, um, not only agreed with our finding, but complemented our approach, which is hard to come by. Um, so these are some of the examples that I was talking about. This one on the left is a photo set just showing some examples of um, some of the pre-Mission 66 residential buildings. Um, on the right are examples of the pre-Mission 66 prescription types um, that are proposed. And um, Craig Shenver is, is holding up some of these um, eight inch smaller barn light fixtures to, to make sure that the scale is appropriate. So for each of the seven areas that make up phase three, we're utilizing a set of tools to confirm and update the inventory while at the same time making prescriptions for each retrofit, and Santiago talked a little bit about this. Um, but again, he set us up really nicely for these steps. And so the image on the upper right shows all of these structures with unique ID numbers, the address, and then all of that um, is also included within this spreadsheet. So we have the unique ID number, the building address, the land assignment is really important because that may be who's actually helping with the installation, whether or not it's dark sky compliant or the retrofit status. Um, then we have the prescription, um, proposed prescription. Um, we get into wall mounting, some details there, and any notes for the installers. So again, this really, um, Oh, and anything that's in red here would be a change or an update to the inventory. Um, so we've completed prescriptions for five of the seven areas that were indicated on the map, um, and I hope to get those other two completed in December. So for phase three, um, we've ordered over a thousand fixtures and lamps. We've just completed some additional nighttime testing of fixtures in some apartment buildings um, that there are certain areas where we're making the area a little bit too dark, um, where we're putting in fully shielded fixtures adjacent to doors, where we have stairs that there used to be an overflow light. Um, we're having to add <clears throat> supplemental light on those stairs. Um, so those, that continual testing has been really helpful in our retrofit process. Uh, we're working on getting contracts for installations January through March, and once the installations are complete, we'll be on track to apply for full designation as an International Dark Sky Park by spring. Um, and then once that happens, we're gonna celebrate a little bit um, and maybe after a brief pause, we'll then start planning for our next phase, which is to have 90% of all exterior fixtures dark sky compliant by 2022. Um, so I'm gonna turn it back over to Raider and he's gonna talk about some innovations in interpretation. All right, thanks Vicki. Just a small part of you guys wish that you can go into your neighborhood and forcibly change all the lights out, right? Just a little bit. <laughs> Pretty awesome. So, uh, as Vicki said, we just want to breeze through this really quick here. We want to leave time for questions and, and, and ideas uh, to be shared. But a little bit about the interpretive side, what we're doing in interpretation and education to kind of uh, 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 spearhead this movement a little bit. Uh, the Obviously, the flagship of our fleet and in interpretation is the Grand Canyon Star Party, and uh, just wrapped up here last June uh, its 28th year, and it really is uh, an amazing event. We have every year in June for eight nights. It's an eight-night event. Uh, over usually over a hundred uh, astronomers come out. Um, 
The catalyst there is the Tucson Amateur Astronomy Association and the uh, uh, Saguaro Astronomy Club, who gather the astronomers. And every night in our back telescope lot, we have somewhere between 50 to 60 telescopes uh, set up. I think we had a 28 inch last, uh, this last year, so that was pretty sweet. And uh, again, these are mostly folks from, I mean, we've got folks from around the world, mostly through the Tucson Amateur Astronomy Association, but actually not all from the Tucson Amateur Astronomy Association. They make up about 20% of the total astronomers that come. And it's a pretty standard event in terms of its layout. Uh, we have a theater uh, at Grand Canyon. We show a movie there typically every day, all day. Uh, uh, in the regular season, uh, at night, we fill it up. And we have a special guest speaker come in and do a presentation, uh, a special guest speaker every night for the eight nights. You know, if anybody is interested or thinks they can provide something really interesting to say, I'm, I'm, I'm the one who coordinates that and I'd love to uh, always get new people to come in. We put you up, you know, in a really romantic place in the canyon. You get to stay a couple nights, give a presentation. It's really fun. We had the folks out there at Sky Glow come. Uh, this just this last year and they did two nights for us. Um, all sorts of folks come out, Dean Regas, Tyler Nordgren, um, Lisa Prado from Lowell Observatory, Ken, Kevin Schindler, all sorts of uh, really awesome speakers, and I know a lot of you guys can offer some great stuff, so please let me know. Don't hesitate. It fills up in about 10 minutes when we open the doors with 233 people. The last couple of years, we've, have, we've been having to deny an extra 230 people who are waiting in line, so this next coming year, we're going to have a, an outdoor projection system set up so that we can um, get as many folks as we can while it's getting dark, showing our presentations. After the uh, presentation, we donate to uh, a, a, a 7 to 15 year old uh, junior ranger out in the audience a, a telescope and that's provided by a, 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 an awesome volunteer named Kevin Lagore down based out of Phoenix uh, with Focus Astronomy. He, he, he donates those telescopes. Well, Celestron, he works for Celestron uh, and they donate the telescopes for us and so that's an awesome thing to be able to do. And then everybody goes outside uh, we have three constellation programs that we give every night. Usually those fill up with 50 to 60 people per constellation program. We have video scopes set up. It is just a wonderful event, uh, and we're always looking for new ideas to uh, innovate and, and uh, uh, make it even more welcoming. I think next year we're considering having a Milky Way family portrait area. <laughs> People can come and like stand and get a cool shot of them and their family in the Milky Way. So that's that's kind of an exciting thing we're looking at. But here's some of the stats just to give you an idea of the scale of the Grand Canyon Star Party. Estimated attendance this last year was 11,223 visitors uh, over the eight, eight evenings. Uh, total night ki time count at telescopes 63,880. That's eyeballs to eyepieces. So 63,000 meaningful contacts with a with a with a visitor at one of these telescopes that is touching a lot of lives that's, that's, but some people can do multiple some people can do multiple visits and we actually in our stats do calibrate that out and we have the average number of visits people attend to uh, visit per scope and i think it's about five five and a half we got this year five and a half uh, um, uh, scopes uh, per visitor. Uh, total theater attendance, 1,840. Total constellation tour attendance, almost 1,300. Total daytime attendance, of course, we do a lot of solar during the day. That's uh, 4,000, nearly 4,000 people attended some of the solar scopes and activities. Over 100 volunteer astronomers made this happen and donated 2,512 hours to this event. So just a really incredible, um, one of the largest uh, probably star parties in at least the National Park Service, I think, uh, we're proud to say. And, and again, a lot of room to, uh, to evolve and get better. Uh, we also do in our interpretive programming, our night sky programming throughout the year, a lot of Globe at Night um, outreach and adv advocacy. Uh, we do entire citizen science based night sky programs with our visitors. So we'll get a big group of 200 or so people and we'll talk specifically about light pollution, the, the troubles of that and everything, and then go into Globe at Night and empower visitors to take that back to their own communities. And one thing I would actually love to see just on a personal note is I think one thing that Globe at Night could use is just one extra little step, uh, a little click down box of maybe where did you hear 
of us. We'd like to be able to quantify our results in a way of how, how effective we are of getting people, you know, to go and use globe at night. So if you can have a little drop down box like Grand Canyon or Bryce Canyon or some other, and then maybe have a competition type of thing where the winner gets, you know, there's a comments field that I use for just that. A comments field? That's great. Yeah. So something like that, maybe a little bit evolved, might um, be able to uh, get some competition to park. And then finally, uh, Moving up, looking forward, we in the National Park Service have been exper uh, experimenting with this sort of new form of interpretation that we're calling audience-centered experience. Uh, and it's, it's worked in a lot of ways. It hasn't worked in some ways. We're just in the experimental mode. And the idea behind audience-centered experience is to kind of get that sort of sage on the stage, as we were calling, you know, have been historically calling park rangers and interpreters, moving them off and, and turning them to the guides on the side and actually uh, getting input and uh, 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 knowledge experiences from the audience, from the visitors themselves, and in a way that can perhaps augment the, the program as a whole. This really hasn't been experimented much with in the realm of night sky preservation and, and interpretation. So there's a lot of experimental things coming out. We recently created a, a short film that I think is uh, pretty powerful. And, I, and, I, and it's, uh, I think, something that can apply not just to interpretation, but also you know, that last session we went to, I went to yesterday about uh, trying to get government officials on board with night sky preservation. I mean, if you, if you want uh, somebody who works for the people to preserve the night skies, I mean, let, let the people maybe have a voice. And so uh, uh, instead of having us as educators and astronomers and interpreters tell people, protect the night skies, you know, let people themselves uh, express how they feel about the night skies. And so what we've been doing is uh, creating a series of audience-centered experience pop-ups. And uh, pop-ups are installations that you're to set up somewhere out in the field. And oftentimes they're not staffed. And just let a visitor come up to it, interact with it in some way. And then if you can take that response of the visitor and synthesize it into something cool, you might get a really neat um, reaction. So this is the movie that we created at the Grand Canyon Star Party. And it's within a series of films that we're hopefully going to create under the um, title of Night Spoken. And these are simply little films that synthesize these pop-ups and the responses of visitors uh, to certain questions that we are probing them on about the night sky. And we hope to get progressively deeper, more intimate questions as we move on. Um, but here is the uh, film for your enjoyment. It's about six minutes long. Kelly, I want to turn it up a little bit. Recording now? Oh, okay. All right. Is it recording now? Oh, it is recording. I see it spinning. Hello. Hello. What's up, guys? Hello. Como estas? Muy bien. Y usted? Bien. Yeah. yeah. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to my show. Hey. Oh. Welcome to the Grand Canyon Star Party. Hello, everybody. It's June 11th, 2018. We are in the Grand Canyon Star Party in the South Rim. What you can see in the sky is amazing. It's just starting to get dark, and I'm sorry that you guys can't see this because it's awesome. And it makes you feel so small and makes your problems go away. And I see all these stars, <laughs> and it's awesome. This is an amazing night. You see thousands upon thousands of stars out here at Grand Canyon. You can see the Milky Way as if it was day, like clouds floating through the sky, both bright and black. There's so many stars, and it's just so gorgeous. 
This is Kara and Michelle. We see Jupiter and its four moons. And it's so pretty and cool. Bye. As I look up at the night sky, it shimmers with stars. See, like for me, uh, when I look at the stars, I see people that, that I know. I just wanted to say that seeing this is absolutely awe-inspiring. There's just so many stars and it's just so gorgeous. I feel like this is something everyone should see. It's just so cool and it just makes you feel so tiny, but also like just so privileged to see this. see a beautiful star out there in the sky at night. It's a lot of stars. It's really beautiful. I just saw uh, some kind of fireball coming down. It was really star. far. Shooting star. No, we call them fireball. No, we call them they, fireball. They call them fireball. No, they are called shooting star. star. <laughs> <laughs> Holy shooting stars. I mean, all I'm going to say is that the, my friends are idiots, but uh, these stars are dope. The stars right now are incredible. Don't be because the stars are dope. It's beautiful out here because the night sky is being preserved at the Grand Canyon. I see my Jupiter and I see Uranus. Tonight we can see Venus, Jupiter, Gemini, the Summer Triangle. Scorpio. All the stars out here are really bright. There are so many stars to see, and all the astronomers are doing a really good job explaining to people who haven't seen these stars before exactly where they are and how they come up and the patterns that they have. We totally need sanctuary areas, designated sanctuary night sky areas. Uh, you won't be able to see any stars. Sorry about that. I like lights. Uh, I'm probably going to pollute the world and destroy it all, so, you know, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah. That's just his opinion. Believe what you want, please. <laughs> My message to the future global light pollution. is to stop global light pollution. light pollution. It's like we don't see no stars. There's no, no stars. There are no stars in the sky, and see the stars. most people, frankly, don't care. They all have iPhones. It's amazing. It's, we just saw the... Jupiter. Jupiter with the rings and the four moons, so I hope you can fix your issue with the lights so you can be back to where we are. See you in the near future. Bye-bye. Put a stop to it. Maybe we can bring the stars back. We do not want to lose that connection with the stars and with this universe. Let us all protect it. I saw Saturn for the first time in my life. My life is complete. Okay, bye. You do a drum mix at your night. Bye. 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 Okay, okay, we're done. Okay. How do we stop it? You broke it. <laughs> Thank you. So just to briefly, um, and by the way, you can find that um, on YouTube uh, under Night Spoken. Feel free to use it um, in any way that you see fit for um, night sky preservation. Uh, and we're just finishing up collecting the responses for a new one. Um, that's going to have a completely different twist and everything like that. So um, we're really excited for that. So be on the lookout for that next one. Um, so we just wanted to finally end by uh, again, saying that we have this incredible opportunity, this incredible resource, uh, a, a set of funding that has come in to really put um, the Dark Sky Initiative on a, a huge platform, uh, that is Grand Canyon. And so even if we don't come up with something like at this conference or, or, or whatever in terms of ideas, feel free to uh, please reach out to us at any time. Um, with ideas, I mean, things like, you know, we thought of uh, some sort of night sky viewing platform that people can go to and learn about the dark sky initiatives and, and, and sit under the night skies. Things like a plaque for the Apollo lunar landing, you know, for the 50 year anniversary somewhere, maybe at the bottom of the canyon, maybe at the top on the rim. Uh, something like cultural, astronomical sort of waysides and exhibitry out at Desert View uh, to celebrate the cultural astronomy of the region. Things like astronomer in residence programs. All these 
type of things um, we're really looking for. So any ideas, um, our, our imaginations are really the, the limit there, and uh, we, we hope to hear from you guys. Uh, so thank you all so much for taking the time to listen to us today. Thanks. Um, so we have about 10 minutes for questions. If you've got a question, please come up here to the microphone. I want to see a show of hands. Are any of you on the IDSP committee here in the audience? Not a one of you, which is really too bad because my point is um, you've gone to this great effort. One of the biggest challenges for uh, an, an organization hoping to get a IDSP designation is the lighting inventory part. That stops a lot of people dead in their tracks. And you have created what I believe could be a template uh, for doing that, right? And I encourage you to work with the IDSP committee to try to see if we can make something like could roll out not only the template, like all the different fields and stuff, that you know, the, the, the field stuff, the inventory of, of lighting fixtures that you've got, this could save uh, future applicants a lot of time and trouble. So let's have some questions. Please introduce yourself. David Quinn, Mesa Verde Museum It was on. Did you hear me? David Quinn, Mesa Verde Museum Association. First of all, congratulations on your status, receiving your status, and working on all you're doing with the retrofitting. We are currently working on becoming an international dark sky park. My question is for Vicki. Um, you mentioned the NEPA compliance and the Mission 66. Were there any other hurdles or problems that you experienced due to the historical status of the buildings trying to retrofit them with these new lights? At Mesa Verde, we also have many historical buildings dating back to the CCC era, the 20s and later. Were there any issues other than what you mentioned? I, I can't really think of any challenges. I think um, what, what worked for us is, is really getting our hands on some candidate fixtures so that we could look at them in place and and make sure that their scale, their material, everything seemed appropriate. And then being able to use those photographs of those candidate fixtures to further, you know, explain that whole process through NEPA really, really helped, I think, all the reviewers be okay with our suggestions. Was there any particular person you had to go to for pre-approval of anything? Uh, we did consult with our regional office, uh, the cultural resource specialists. I can't tell you who the name is of oh, that person, okay. but, um, but yes, they approved our approach. All right, maybe compare notes after. Yeah, we, we can do yes, that. Yes, definitely. All right, thank you. Hi, Jake Holgerson, Petrified Forest. Um, my question was for Vicki. Uh, with your experience with the PAR-20 lights, how was that, um, like the pros or cons, or just your opinion of using that as an all-purpose uh, dark sky light? So when we did our recent tests a couple of weeks ago, um, we found that it's not perfect for all purpose. It works really good for the smaller Kitchler fixture because it's narrower. Um, we also have a larger Kitchler fixture that we're looking at and um, the cutoff in that particular one was 25 degrees and so it, it really was too much of a, a spot. Um, and so we actually you know, it, it works for those kinds of fixtures, but we're definitely looking at other lamps for other fixtures. For having such a large inventory, did you find one that's a good all-purpose, just... There's just not one size needs, fits all. Right. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Thank you. But again, the, this notion of coming up with an inventory of, of you know, sort of pre-approved, good retrofitting, uh, if, if, if we can make some sort of, you know, catalog of that, something, a subset of the fixture seal of approval, um, I, again, people who are applying could, could really utilize that. Happy to share. Hi, I'm Dan Derisco. Uh, in my former job, um, I did a report on Grand Canyon, 
By the way, um, it is really nice to see this happening. Uh, but in that report were these seen luminance um, images calibrated in, you know, like of the El Tovar, Bright Angel Lodge, etc. Uh, if you could uh, duplicate those after the retrofits and produce some kind of a before and after case study on this, that would be uh, a great uh, addition to, um, to the work you've done here. Um, I also wanted to comment, I think this is a private donor success story. So those of you who have plenty of money and you're looking for a uh, uh, tax write-off, this shows that you don't have to pay taxes to get this done. You can give your money to uh, the foundation and say, I want it done. I want this money to go to this. It works. In this case, it works very well. And of course, the Park Service has contributed the efforts of these folks and all the electricians and so forth to make it happen as well through taxpayer money. But the, without the private donor money, it wouldn't have happened, or at least not on this scale. Um, and another suggestion uh, of what to do in the future, I think in the middle of the Desert View parking lot, you should build Richie's Observatory. <laughs> Very nice. <laughs> And, and just a really brief comment uh, for to respond to Dan that uh, the uh, the large donor uh, was very interested in those luminance comparison studies as well. So we probably will end up doing doing that before and after, and and, and that was him really interested in that. So. And if you can't do them yourself, my new company. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we'll get you out there, Dan. <laughs> Hi, Adrian Fitzgerald from Zion National Park. I had a question about the, um, you, when you were talking about the light bulbs and the certain lumens that they would be for your replacement bulbs in many places, I think it was below 500, except if they were fully shielded. And so I was a little curious if there are some that are not fully shielded in your park now or like what you intend in, in those cases. So, it's, it's on. so part of, um, Particularly in the historic areas, um, like the Bright Angel Lodge, we have all these cabins and they have these little tiny glass lanterns. They're not necessarily historic, but they are definitely in keeping. And so in those cases, that's where we're just relamping. But again, um, that's like a one watt LED, 2400K. 100 lumen lamp and so we feel that you know in those cases where we can't fully shield or where we choose not to that by relamping with something that is so low in level that it can be dark sky compliant so i guess it's just represented in your lighting um, guidelines or lighting ordinance that you set for grand canyon that that is is acceptable for your your yes. setting okay cool thank you Hello, Randy Stanley, Nat uh, National Park Service. I have a, a bit of a specialized question. Um, was there a connection between the lighting database and the facility management software system to kind of enable our fees to track lighting and database? Yeah. To that. yeah, so so one of the kind of roundabout ways we can do it is so Buildings are, of course, are in the facilities management uh, database, and so through GIS, we can e easily assign a fixture to a building and um, you know assign it to the building itself. But we haven't taken that next step in terms of making that inventory part of um, that that database. I believe. And when we did our phase three compliance and we're putting together all the information by era, one of the things that we also did is we cataloged every single building number that is tied to FMSS. And so we have that ability. We haven't actively updated it yet. Okay, thank you. Some of our parks do track their lighting that way and I thought it might be useful to learn what you're doing. Thank you. Yeah. Please introduce yourself. 
Hi, Kurt Fristrup, also National Park Service. I think it's great the IDA enabled so many MPSers to get together. Um, <laughs> this big changeover you're about to do, it's clear the, natural, the Interp staff is really involved. By any chance, did any of the natural resource staff get involved in doing any before or after monitoring plans to see the event? If you're changing 1,200 lights, is anybody tracking, did the adjacent habitat respond? So, so in our physical science program, we have um, an individual that has taken SQM readings uh, consistently. Um, and so we'll have kind of that body of data right. um, as a before. And I know uh, Raider is also involved in that effort, so he can speak to that um, a little more. So. I, I was thinking of the wet things that walk around, not so much the physics of the place, but you know, both in terms of, uh, also of course, there could be a visitor experience component, but to what extent did the biologic resources of the park respond? And I, 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 say, I, I chose to come up because I think there are many other people who might be involved in big lighting retrofits, and at very small levels of effort or cost, or, it might be possible to show you know, there are other benefits, that there are other organisms that benefit from these actions. But if you don't think about it in advance, all you can go is look at what, you know, the after condition doesn't tell you very much if you don't know what the before was. Yeah, that's, that, that's exactly right. Yeah. Andreas, you're going to be the last okay. questioner, but I just want to point out, if you think, you know, the National Park Service has been a huge partner with the IDA for many years, starting with the great night sky work. Uh, that Chad and Dan started. But the arc has been to coming to this, where we have a session and we have national park people talking to each other about how to optimize the lighting for the dark sky purposes uh, in their individual parks, and they are dominating the questioning. I think that's an accomplishment. <laughs> Andreas. Okay. Uh, Andreas uh, Hennel from, from Germany. It was a very nice presentation to see how you worked on uh, getting a dark sky park, and it reminded me uh, all the work we had to do with the dark sky parks also in Germany. But I have a specific question, because in one of our parks we have also a star party. Uh, well, not as large as this. Uh, there are about 100 people that are coming there. Uh, but our intention was to put it into a, um, a time, especially in fall, when there are not so many tourists in the region. Uh, I see that you have uh, the star party in June, when I think that's high tourist peak season. Uh, thought you about uh, putting this to another time when there are not so many tourists in Grand Canyon. Or perhaps every day there are always so many tourists there. Uh, at this point, the great question, at this point, yeah, it's pretty much year round that we're having a, a lot of visitors. I mean, even just last year, I gave a star talk in the uh, late December, it was about zero degrees outside, and I had about 100 people. Uh, and they, you know, I called them all crazy to their face, but they, <laughs> they loved it. And so, and my philosophy is the, the, the more the merrier, because I mean, if we can officially spread this message to as many people as possible, then, then, it's, and it's, then it's good. And we have the infrastructure, actually, crazily enough, to go way bigger than we've, we're even at right now. So um, I don't think we're hitting enough people yet, because there's a lot more people in the park that aren't going to the star party than, than, than are attending at this point. So we'd like to flip that. Yeah, I agree. I think you know there, there are different components to why to have a star party. But what they're showing is, and we see this also in Acadia, uh, at their uh, Night Sky Festival, it's how can we maximize the number of touches, the people that, that, that we see, the people that we affect, the people that go back and sing our praises later on. Okay, thank you very much for all of that uh, great commentary. Uh, thank you again, another round of applause for this great effort. <laughs>